Kate lay on the bed, gazing at the ceiling, her body partially covered by a sheet, and a soft smile gracing her lips. She was content with her life, and yearned to share this joy with the world. She loved her husband dearly, but she always held back her emotions around him, as he disapproved of excessive displays of them. Turning her head, Kate looked at her husband. His attention was fixed on a painting hanging across the room, deep in thought. She affectionately asked, "'What are you thinking about, my love?' Caught off guard, Damien shrugged and answered absent-mindedly, "'Oh, nothing, really.' However, Kate could tell he was troubled by something. She got closer to him and rested her head on his chest. "'I can tell you're thinking about something. Won't you tell me?' Damien sighed. His wife was persistent, and he knew she wouldn't stop until he responded. He glanced at her, then back at the painting, before speaking slowly. "'I think we need a bigger apartment.' Kate immediately straightened up and looked him in the eyes. She was taken aback. They had discussed this a year ago, but Damien had been against it. Their current apartment suited them perfectly, so why the need for a new one? Of course, Kate hinted that it would be time for them to have children already, but her husband was not yet ready. "'Do you really mean it, Damien? Are you serious?' Kate asked, hopeful. Damien shrugged his shoulders. "'I'm not a fool. I understand everything. Yes, I think it's time for us to think about expanding our living space, given the planned changes. But please, no childish talk until we sort out the apartment.' Kate snuggled up to her husband again and showered him with kisses. "'No, no, I promise, no baby talk,' she assured. Damien sighed and smiled faintly. He saw that Kate could barely contain her excitement. It was quite obvious. If Damien had let her, she would have screamed with joy, run around the house, and jumped on the bed. However, he deliberately did not allow her to express her feelings. He liked to control her, he felt important in her life as long as she obeyed. He kissed her on the forehead and replied, Let's go to sleep. We'll discuss everything later. This weekend we'll talk about it and come up with a plan. Good night, dear. Hearing his words, Kate frowned slightly. Should she wait a whole week to discuss everything? Was he kidding? At that moment, she was ready to talk all night long. Kate knew that if he said that, he wouldn't even talk to her about the apartment for a week. He might have done it deliberately to make her suffer, but Kate didn't resent him for that. She was too fond of him to pay attention to such trifles. He loves her. That's the most important thing. Their feelings have been tested for years, and nothing can separate them. They'll always be together. Damien turned away from Kate and began to drift off to sleep. Kate looked at the painting, remembering the past, it seemed like an eternity ago, even though it had only been a couple of years. They met when Kate had just graduated from high school and Damien from university. To her, he seemed like an adult who had a job, while she was a naive girl dreaming of the prince. Damien became her prince. He invited her to dinner in restaurants, drove her around in his car, and gave her luxurious gifts. He was somewhat restrained, requiring Kate to restrain her emotions too. She admired him and fell head over heels in love with him. After a year of dating, Damien proposed to her. Kate was in college at the time. For her birthday, he gave her an expensive diamond ring and a chic dinner at a restaurant. Her friends were jealous that she got such a catch, a mature man who would go to the ends of the earth for her. They got married. The ceremony was modest, because Damien didn't want to spend too much on a lavish celebration. After the wedding, they went on a trip to Europe, which delighted Kate. She had never left her homeland before, and believed that she was lucky not only to marry for love, but also to secure a promising future for herself. The couple bought an apartment together, sharing the costs. Kate's parents helped her with her share, and Damien used the inheritance from his grandmother. Kate, after graduating from college, found a good job. Her income was almost equal to her husband's. They were thinking about starting a family, but Damien didn't think that they were ready yet. Children are a huge responsibility. We need to think through all the aspects and plan carefully. The tragedy occurred 
when Kate's parents died. Her mother struggled with a serious illness and died of cancer within six months. Her father died of a heart attack three months later, unable to cope with his grief. Kate's grief was immense. Thanks to her husband's support, she survived this terrible stroke of fate. The loss of both parents strengthened her attachment to her husband, who became her only support. Damien was her only family now. Kate had a cousin, Donna, who lived in another city. As children, Donna would often visit during vacations, but life took them in different directions over time. They maintained a relationship, exchanging holiday and birthday greetings, but their interaction was limited. Kate sold the apartment she inherited from her parents and deposited the money in the bank. If Damien contributed a little more, the sale of their current one-bedroom apartment would afford them a spacious two- or even four-bedroom apartment. This would allow them to start a family. The thought of becoming a mother brought Kate to tears. She touched her flat belly and smiled at the prospect. She couldn't wait for it to happen. She was already thirty years old. It was time to have a baby. Kate closed her eyes and sighed as she began to drift off to sleep. Throughout the night, she had strange dreams filled with children reaching out to her, begging her to save them. Yet as soon as she extended her hands, they vanished. Next, she found herself in complete darkness, locked in a small room. Despite her frantic knocking and screaming for help, no one came and she woke up. The unsettling remnants of the dream lingered until morning, but then all memories of the nightmare evaporated. Days passed, and it was finally Friday. Kate discovered a flat tyre on her car that morning, so she took a cab to work. After work, she planned to visit her favourite pastry shop to buy Damien's beloved cupcake. The shop wasn't far, but she decided to walk, enjoying the beautiful weather and her excellent mood. Today was the day she would discuss their plans, including buying a new home and outlining their next steps. Kate had been walking around for twenty minutes when she turned into a quiet alleyway. This path, lined with private houses and devoid of high-rise buildings, served as a shortcut. She adored this street for its tranquility and the absence of cars. The houses were exceptionally beautiful, and she dreamt of owning one of these houses. To her, even the air on this street seemed different, cleaner and fresher. Taking a deep breath, she smiled at the thought of owning a house instead of an apartment. They could create a cosy yard to enjoy quiet evenings, engaging in pleasant conversations. Once their baby was born, Kate envisioned spending endless hours outside, strolling near the house with the baby. She imagined Damien building a playground and sandbox for their child, providing endless fun. Kate strolled down the street, lost in dreams of the future. She paused before a seemingly uninhabited house. It was large, majestic, with sizable windows. It wasn't new, but its charm remained undiminished. Kate looked at the house for a few minutes, and then she realised that if someone saw her, it could raise questions due to her suspicious actions. She quickly glanced around, relieved to find the street deserted. She resumed her leisurely stroll, reaching an intersection. Despite the absence of traffic lights, a crosswalk was present. In all her time spent walking here, not a single car had passed by. The tranquility was palpable. Kate concluded that this was, indeed, the ideal neighbourhood to reside in. The woman smiled thoughtfully and then began to cross the road. Suddenly, she heard the squeal of brakes. Time seemed to slow, each second dragging like thick honey. Initially, Kate didn't know where the sound was coming from, but then she realised it was right beside her. Frozen in the middle of the road, she turned her head to the left. The last thing she saw was a bright yellow car bearing down on her. She even managed to catch a glimpse of the driver, a woman with fiery red hair and a terrified expression. Her eyes and mouth were wide open, likely screaming in fear. Before losing consciousness, she felt an overwhelming sadness and fear, which she assumed was a precursor to death. Then everything went black. What's the next step? We can't just leave things as they are. We have to act. 
Kate heard her husband's voice, but it sounded muffled, as if she had cotton in her ears. She felt so unwell that she didn't even want to open her eyes. She wanted to be alone, and considered telling Damien to move his phone conversation to another room, but her tongue wouldn't cooperate. I've told you there's nothing I can do. I suggest you accept that. If you continue to create a scandal, I'll have to have you removed. Don't yell at me. I'm just doing my job. Which doesn't include tolerating disrespect, a strange voice said. Kate furrowed her brow in confusion. She didn't recognize the voice. Was she ill? Had Damien called a doctor? Why was her body in pain? Why couldn't she muster the strength to even open her eyes? What was happening? She lifted her hand without opening her eyes, touching her lips. They felt so parched, she thought she couldn't speak. She's awake. Kate, can you hear me? Say you can hear me. It's me, Damien. I can hear you fine, but I can't talk loudly. Why do I feel so unwell? whispered Kate. She felt Damien grasp her hand. You've been in an accident, dear, he said gently. Suddenly, Kate remembered. A brief flash of memory, and she recalled being hit by a car at a crosswalk. It felt like it was yesterday, or maybe a few days ago. She struggled to grasp how much time had passed. She opened her eyes, but darkness still surrounded her. What was happening? Why is it so dark? Did the lights go out? She asked softly. The only response was silence. Kate could feel a sense of unease creeping in. She asked again. Damien? What's happening? Why is it so dark? What occurred? Please don't stay silent. It's frightening me. Where am I? Why is it dark? Her voice was raising in volume, and the onset of panic was evident. Damien squeezed her hand and said, Calm down, Kate. We'll fix it. This is only temporary. We'll be right by your side. Don't worry. You're temporarily blind, but your eyes are perfectly fine. Don't worry, Kate. We'll find the best doctors and they will diagnose the problem. You'll see again. Everything will return to normal, I promise. Just stay calm. Damien's words struck Kate's heart like a stone. Overwhelmed by panic, she felt as if she were about to perish from terror. She attempted to get out of bed, clutching the sheets and pushing Damien's hands away. Opening her eyes wide, she realized she couldn't see anything. This terrifying sensation made her feel dizzy, though she couldn't be certain, since she couldn't see anything. She needs to be sedated. Hold her hand. I'll do it. Damien held his wife, who was struggling with her unexpected state, and immediately Kate felt weakness seep into her. Despite this, she continued to cry and convulse in her husband's arms, her strength slowly ebbing away. As she teetered on the edge of consciousness, she heard the doctor speak with her husband. It's shock. She'll get better. The initial reaction is always the most intense. She'll overcome this. Everyone finds a way to cope when there are no other options, the doctor said in a steady voice. But how? How is this possible? She barely has any physical injuries. How could she lose her sight so suddenly, from a single blow? Can such a thing really happen? Damien's voice was filled with worry and fear. When Kate awoke, she was still under the influence of the injection. Damien was by her side. She calmly requested that he update her on the recent events. It was revealed that Kate had been in the hospital for two weeks, a fact that shocked her. She had assumed that the accident had occurred just a day or two prior, yet she had been in the hospital for a full fourteen days. The most unsettling part was that there were no witnesses to the accident. No one had seen it happen, nor did anyone know how long she had been lying on the road. Doctors estimated that she was unconscious for approximately ten to fifteen minutes before being found. A passing driver saw her and called an ambulance. Miraculously, she suffered no severe injuries, only some bruises, a broken elbow and a cracked rib. However, she had hit her head quite hard. After an examination, Kate was diagnosed with a moderate concussion, which had led to an unforeseen consequence. She lost her vision. 
As Damien relayed this information, she held his hand tightly, trying to stay composed. She knew Damien disliked emotional outbursts, and from his calm voice, it was clear he wouldn't appreciate any tears or screams. In her confusion, she would occasionally open her eyes and turn towards Damien, only to be reminded of her blindness. Each time she would quickly shut her eyes again, striving for calm. Once Damien shared all the details, she attempted to gather her strength. What was she to do next? Damien informed her that she wouldn't be kept in the hospital any longer, since she didn't have severe injuries, and the immediate danger had passed. A doctor who specialises in such injuries is coming today. I've paid a substantial amount for his examination and advice. Don't worry. I hope he can guide us in restoring your sight. I trust that you will recover. It must be so, dear. Kate also hoped for the same, feeling that otherwise life had no meaning. The professor conducted a consultation, but his words were far from comforting. If he had at least taken Damien aside and spoken privately, Kate could have retained a slither of hope. But he delivered his verdict in her presence. I'm sorry, but your prognosis is grave. Your eyesight won't be restored. Unfortunately, such injuries are common, and their impact on the human body can be unpredictable. I can say with confidence that in your case, there's nothing that can be done, unless we could replace your brains, which sadly is impossible. Medicine hasn't progressed that far yet. I know that you'll seek the best doctors, that you want a second opinion. You're right to do so, but I assure you that any doctor will tell you the same thing I just did. My advice to you is to accept everything and move forward. Many people lead even more fulfilling lives after vision loss. You are the only one who can handle this. But remember, you're not alone. Your husband is there to help and support you. Accept as soon as possible that you will be blind forever and start living by the new rules. If needed, I can provide contacts of specially trained individuals who can help you adapt to your new environment. They can teach you to navigate at home. Many people even learn to get around independently without assistance. As a young woman, believe me, you can learn this. While it may take a few years, it is certainly possible. Damien and Kate listened silently to the doctor, whose words extinguished their smallest hope for a cure. When the doctor left, Kate could no longer contain her emotions. She didn't throw a tantrum or rage but she cried so bitterly that anyone who heard her also had tears in their eyes. Kate mourned her broken life, her happy future, her plans and everything that pleased her in life. She couldn't see anything now. She had become blind. Why should she live? She couldn't do anything anymore. No more cooking, no more going to work or shopping, no more putting on makeup. No more smiling at her husband, looking at his face. All the things that used to give her pleasure, the most ordinary things that she used to not pay much attention to, they are all out of her reach now. She will never be complete again. She will grow old and not even know what she looks like. Her husband will see her change. She won't even be able to care for herself because she won't see the change in her appearance. It's horrible. It's a nightmare. No, she doesn't want to live like that. She'd rather die than live like this. Kate remained in the hospital for a few more days until her doctor deemed that she no longer required medical attention. She was discharged and returned to what was once her familiar home. Despite being surrounded by familiar objects and walls, she felt neither calm nor peace. Her home had become a labyrinth where she navigated in complete darkness. For the first day after her return, Kate was too frightened to move. She appreciated that Damien took a week off work to help her adjust to her new condition. Damien chose not to hire specialists, despite knowing that they could provide assistance. After contacting several, he found their services expensive, which they couldn't afford at the time. Kate was unable to work, and the future was uncertain. 
Damien had spent a portion of their savings on Kate's medical needs, including doctors, medications, diagnostic tests, and consultations. Now Damien was the sole breadwinner and providing for their living expenses, and Kate's continued medication needs fell to him alone. As a result, he decided to forego further medical specialists and assist Kate himself. Damien spent a week helping Kate adjust to her new circumstances. He guided her around their home, teaching her to identify objects by touch. He showed her how to use the shower and toilet, and he oriented her to the layout of their home. He encouraged her to navigate independently. Kate was also haunted by a strange dream she had had a few days before the accident. The dream was of children in a dark, silent room with a locked door. She felt despair, consternation, bitterness, and fear. Now, in her current situation, she understood the dream as a warning. Could she have averted this disaster? Had she interpreted that dream correctly? It's uncertain. Perhaps this is her destiny, unchangeable. Kate cried every night. Her husband comforted her as much as he could, but by the end of his days off, he told her, Kate, you must stop crying so much. I can't comfort you indefinitely. I have work on Monday. Your sobs keep me awake at night. You don't give yourself or me any respite. We can't continue like this. Why should we continue? I'm losing my mind and you're asking me to calm down. How can I calm down when I'll never be the same again? I can't accept it, Kate replied tearfully, while Damien continued to console her. Time passed. Damien returned to work. After a few sleepless nights, he began sleeping in the living room. Kate worried that they would never be as close as before, and promised Damien she would stop crying. He purchased calming pills for her, which provided some relief, and she even began sleeping through the night. Three months post-accident, they made love for the first time, an unusual experience for Kate due to the complete darkness. She tried to imagine it as a simple power outage. Despite their success, she couldn't shake the feeling that Damien was treating her differently. She tried to dismiss these thoughts, but it was challenging. One day, Kate asked Damien about their plan to buy a bigger apartment. Kate, are you out of your mind? Why do we need a bigger place now? A new home is a new space. How will you navigate an unfamiliar environment? when you can barely move around our current apartment. You won't be able to walk a step. It'll take you a year to memorize where everything is, and I don't have time for that. I have to work. I'm trying to feed us while you're at home. This response left Kate nearly choking with indignation. Why do you say that? Am I to blame for what happened to me? Am I at home by choice? I'd gladly work 24 hours a day if I could. And you're telling me that I'm not doing anything? Shame on you. I'm not ashamed because I didn't say anything reprehensible. I stated the facts as they are. I didn't mean to offend you. I was simply explaining the current situation. We can't afford a new home right now. It's wise to conserve our savings. We don't know what could happen. Having a financial cushion is beneficial. I wasn't trying to insult or upset you. Kate clenched her fists in frustration, leaning back in her chair. She yearned to look into her husband's eyes, to read his gaze, to understand his feelings, but that was impossible. She tried to regain her composure, but couldn't. She felt tears roll down her cheeks and whispered softly, "'What about the baby? We wanted a baby, didn't we? We planned to buy an apartment so we'd have room for the baby. But... How can we find room for a baby in this apartment? It's barely big enough for the two of us. Silence followed. Kate regretted for the umpteenth time that she couldn't see her husband's face. What was he thinking? Was he looking at her or away? What child? Have you lost your mind along with your eyesight? How can we even discuss having a child if you're blind? I'm unsure whether you're laughing at me or mocking me. Sure, you might be able to have a baby, that's understandable. 
But what happens after that? How will you care for it? You're blind, Kate. You can't see anything. If you've forgotten, you can't do anything independently. Perhaps you could feed the baby, but only if I assist you. You're incapable of anything else. So what's next? Do I quit my job to take care for the child while you're satisfied that you've fulfilled your duty? What's in it for me? To pause my life with a blind wife and a young child? You definitely need a psychiatrist. Kate, you have a significant issue if you even dare to consider having a child. Kate was taken aback by everything she had heard. Damien was harsh and furious as he hurled those unpleasant words at her. Eventually, he stormed out of the kitchen and Kate heard the front door slam shut. He left without even mentioning when he would return. However, Kate was not particularly concerned about that at the moment. She tried to process what she had heard. So, her dream of a complete family would never become a reality. She would never become a mother or have the chance to cradle a child in her arms. She was devastated, feeling as though she had nothing left. She sat at the table, clutching the dried night mask she had pulled over her eyes. No longer crying, she was immersed in her own darkness. It wasn't long before Damien returned. He approached her and sat down next to her. Kate, I apologize. I was too harsh and said things I shouldn't have. I've reconsidered and I want to... He was cut off by Kate. The fault is mine. I've been foolish. My blindness has changed me, but I won't behave like this any more. I'll strive to be more sensible, to stop saying things that upset you. I don't want to argue, because you're my only confidant. You're the only one who cares for me. I don't want to lose you. The idea of a baby is absurd. You're right. Having a child is not feasible. I entirely agree with you. I promise to avoid such foolish remarks in the future. Please forgive me. Initially, Damien was taken aback, but then he smiled and said, Yes, dear, that's precisely what I meant. Let's not fight any more. We're facing tough times. If we argue, we'll harm our relationship and I don't want that. I love you. We'll get through this, but we need to stick together. The baby will only complicate things. We can't manage him in our current state. I'm pleased you understand this. It shows your common sense is still intact. Let's move on. I'm hungry. Are you? I'll prepare something. Kate hid her tears and smiled. Despite Damien's emotional distance, she tried to hold on. But it was becoming increasingly difficult. She had hoped they would overcome the difficulties together, but that wasn't the case. A gap of misunderstanding began to form between her and her husband. Kate feared it wouldn't end well, and it didn't. From that day forward, they grew further apart. For Kate, change was impossible. She couldn't even leave without support. Damien's behaviour also changed. He began to stay late at work more frequently, or perhaps he was somewhere else entirely. Kate couldn't ascertain the truth. Feeling bored at home, she asked Damien to teach her how to use the telephone. After some thought, her husband purchased a push-button phone for her. He programmed all the necessary numbers and instructed her on how to use it. Among the numbers, she insisted on having her cousins. They had only spoken once since an accident, with her cousin offering help and her refusing. Equipped with the phone, Kate could now call Damien any time, which somewhat eased her loneliness. She wore the phone on a lanyard around her neck and frequently phoned Damien at work. Initially, Damien answered all her calls. However, he soon started to resent the constant interruptions. Don't you realise you're distracting me? Did I buy you this phone just to have you bother me all the time? Please, Kate, stop calling me so often, otherwise I'll be disgusted to come home. Sometimes I already feel that way. Upon hearing those words, Kate felt a wave of sorry for herself. However, she stopped calling her husband incessantly, only reaching out when necessary or when he was late from work. When she questioned his late arrivals, Damien would respond angrily and irritably. Why are you asking? 
I have to work twice as hard. Your disability pension is barely enough. I work late because I get paid for the extra hours. Don't bother me with your questions. Surely you understand how difficult this is for me. Afterwards, Kate refrained from asking more questions. A week later, Damien was so long away that she got worried and wanted to call him. She grew anxious and decided to call him. He took an unusual amount of time to pick up the phone, and when he finally did, his voice brimmed with irritation. Why are you calling? he asked. I was wondering when you're coming home. It's ten o'clock at night. You've never been this late before. Is everything okay? Kate asked with concern. Nothing's wrong. You're just distracting me. If something had happened, I would have called you. I'm fine. I'll be home around midnight. Damien replied sternly. Kate almost calmed down after hearing his voice, but when Damien ended the conversation, he did not immediately disconnect the cell phone, and Kate distinctly heard a woman's soft laughter, followed by her words. Has she called again? Forget about her. Come to me. Kate gripped her push-button phone tightly. Was there another woman with her husband? Wasn't he supposed to be at work? Suddenly, Kate realized exactly where Damien was. He had likely been deceiving her for quite some time, spending his evenings with another woman. This woman had replaced Kate, and now Damien didn't even want to return to his blind wife. Perhaps Kate had lost her appeal, and Damien was repulsed by her, seeking solace in a young and beautiful girl who pampered him and showed him pity. Kate couldn't wait for Damien to return home. As soon as he stepped through the door, she confronted him with her suspicions. She was prepared for anything but his cold indifference. I don't understand what's your problem with me. What's wrong with you? What's wrong? You have to be joking. You're likely cheating on me, and I'm left to agonize over it. Who was that woman? Your partner? Your co-worker? Tell me! Kate exclaimed loudly. Ah, so that's what you're referring to. Are you certain you want to know everything? Well, all right. I don't want to keep anything from you. I've done nothing to be ashamed of. Yes, I spend time with another woman, and I believe I need it. At home, I have a blind wife who can't feed me, can't take care of me, and can't show me affection in a normal way. Do you think this is easy for me? I've endured it for so long, but it's simply unbearable. I can't sacrifice my life just to care for you. I'm already fed up with everything. Life didn't prepare me for this. I want to come home and relax, see a beautiful, well-groomed wife, enjoy a nice dinner. Not this. I come home, and I have to take care of you, feed you, help you shower. If only you knew what you look like now. Your hair is grey and unkempt. Your eyebrows are ungroomed. You're pale, and you don't have a manicure. It's simply horrifying. You don't make me want to touch you. That's why I have to visit a woman after work who takes care of me and rejuvenates me. Kate was engulfed by a wave of rage and indignation. You have no right to hurt and deceive me in this way, let alone discuss it so openly. I won't allow you to torment me. Then Damien laughed, a sound so unpleasant that Kate was covered in goosebumps. What are you going to do? Kick me out? Go ahead, try. But I'm telling you now you won't succeed. I'm not leaving. This isn't just your apartment. And I'm going to live here doing whatever I want. And you can't stop me. Who are you? Just a helpless woman who can't do anything without me. You're dependent on me. You can't even step outside this apartment without my help. If you don't like it, you can leave. I'm not stopping you. But how far will you get, my dear? That's it. You'll stay home and wait for me to return from work. I'll come whenever I please. I'll feed and bathe you. I'll clean your disheveled hair and take care of cooking and cleaning. You will silently smile and thank me.
Understand, if you ever mention being unhappy again, you'll regret it. You'll go a week with only dry rations. Or I'll leave you alone for several nights, making you feel so lonely that you'll wish for my presence. No, Kate murmured quietly. What did you say? Damien frowned, taken aback by her interruption. I said, no, I won't tolerate you sleeping with another woman. I refuse to live like that. So, what if I'm blind? I'm your wife, do you hear me? Or have you forgotten? Some unfortunate accident took my sight, but I'm still the same person. I simply can't see. I'm trying to learn everything possible to lessen your burden, but I need time and your support. How can you provide that support if you're not home? No, I won't tolerate your infidelity. Kate's voice, though soft, was firm. Damien eyed her in bewilderment. How dare she speak to him that way? She was nothing. Ah, so you're not satisfied. Well then, good riddance. Leave. I'm not stopping you, nor will I try to. Why don't you say something? Pack your things and go. The door is open, dear. Kate stood still. After a moment, she said quietly, Fine. I won't be here tomorrow. She carefully made her way out of the kitchen and into the bedroom. She sat on the bed, feeling numb. She felt so vulnerable that words couldn't capture it. There were no tears because she didn't even feel like crying. She just wanted to disappear, to sink into the ground, to leave without a trace, so that no one would even remember her. Where would she go? She had said she wouldn't be here tomorrow. But where could she go if she didn't leave the house? Why did she say that? Because she couldn't stay with him any longer. Kate heard Damien taking a shower, and she thought of one person who could help her. She reached for the phone hanging around her neck, gripping it tightly. After fumbling for the right button, she dialed a specific number and held the phone to her ear. What if they were asleep and didn't answer? After a few seconds, she heard a slightly sleepy voice. Yes, I'm listening. Hello, Donna, this is Kate. Please excuse my late call. Kate? Did something happen? Is it something with Damien? No, there's nothing wrong with Damien. Donna, I need your help. I'm not in danger, but I need help. I'm sorry, I didn't know who else to call. No problem. What's going on? I'll help you however I can. Tell me quickly, what do you need? Donna... Could you please help me escape? I need to leave Damien immediately. You're my only hope. I apologise for the late call again. I'm just at a loss. When should I come? Is it urgent? I can catch a train tomorrow morning and be there by noon. Is that okay? Great. Don't worry, I'm on vacation. You're not inconveniencing me. See you tomorrow. After hanging up, Kate sighed with relief, her hand over her racing heart. Everything would be okay. Donna would arrive tomorrow. With Damien at work, they could pack in peace. She never wanted to return here. She just needed her documents and bank card. She had a bank account with money from the sale of her parents' apartment. Financially, she was secure. Everything would be fine. Ten minutes later, Damien entered the bedroom with an arrogant snort. He made it clear that he dismissed her words as insignificant believing she wouldn't go anywhere. He was convinced she couldn't even take a step without him, comparing her to a blind and defenceless kitten. I'll sleep in the living room. I'll give you a few days to cool down and dispel those delusions of leaving, he said. Once you apologize for your behavior and accept that I have another woman, then I'll treat you kindly again, and all will be well. Good night. With that, Damien took his pillow and plaid and left. Kate listened to his speech in silence, not responding. She clenched her fingers tightly, the pain a reflection of her turmoil. She resolved to never let anyone treat her this way again. Yes, she was blind, but she could still feel, love and even hate if necessary. Kate spent half the night sorting through her clothes, identifying each item by touch. By three in the morning, she had packed everything she planned to take with her. When Donna arrived, they would gather the necessary documents, and Kate would leave the apartment, 
that once brought her so much joy, but from which she now yearned to escape. The next day, Donna arrived around one in the afternoon. She hugged her cousin without asking what had transpired. Donna helped Kate pack her suitcase and located all the documents that Kate had listed. She placed everything in a separate folder and put it in the suitcase. After a moment's thought, Kate asked her, Do you think I should take all my jewellery, or would it be better to leave them for him? Donna frowned and replied firmly, I don't know what's happened to you yet. It doesn't seem like things are going well, but you can take whatever you want, and no one will judge you for it. Kate sighed and instructed her cousin, Then take the jewellery box in the closet. Once they had finished packing, Donna helped Kate put on her sneakers and handed her sunglasses. The woman stood in the hallway for a moment before Kate firmly stated, We need to leave as soon as possible. I can't stay here any longer. And with that they departed. Donna hailed a cab and they headed to the train station. At the station, Donna purchased two tickets to her city. Their train was scheduled to leave in two hours. During that time, the women sat in the station cafe where Kate shared her story. Throughout the conversation, Donna found herself wiping away tears. She felt a deep sympathy for her cousin, who had endured so much, and she was determined to help. She didn't regret coming. Kate needed someone to guide her through this difficult time, someone to teach her how to survive in a world that doesn't always offer help and support to those with disabilities. Donna decided then and there, she would be that person. She had no intention of spending her life as Kate's faithful assistant. Instead, she planned to teach Kate how to manage everyday tasks that posed no challenge to a sighted person. This began their life together. Donna had a two-bedroom apartment courtesy of her wealthy ex-husband. They had married young and for love, but the love quickly dissipated. The marriage lasted three years, followed by a divorce in which he bought her an apartment in exchange for her not claiming anything else. Thankfully, they had no children. Donna's vacation had just begun, with three weeks of rest ahead. Starting the day after her arrival, she began to work with Kate. Kate was initially shocked. She had planned to spend some time mourning her late and faded family life, but Donna didn't allow her that luxury. "'If you expect to lie on the bed from morning until evening,' You are wrong. Yes, I'm sorry that you're blind, but you have to realize that either you will become strong and continue your life under the new rules, or you'll just turn into an old sourpuss who will curse everyone. I felt sorry for you, but I'm not going to feel sorry for you any more. I have three weeks to teach you to be more or less on your own, and I demand that you pull yourself together and work hard. Not lying on the bed or snotty, Donna declared. Kate understood she had to live by her cousin's rules. Donna was providing her shelter, so it was better not to upset or disappoint her. They both prepared to get down to work. The first night Donna spent there, Kate had a strange dream, similar to the one she had before the accident. She found herself locked in a dark room once more. As she stumbled in the darkness, she discovered the familiar door. She yanked the handle, but it was locked yet again. Suddenly, she heard a rustling sound downstairs. Crouching down, she felt the floor with her hands and found a small key. Could this be the key to the door? Rising, she located the door's keyhole, inserted the key, and to her amazement, the door swung open. A blinding light forced her to shield her eyes with her hand. The final image she remembered before waking up was a dark-haired, dark-eyed man extending his arms towards her. The following morning, the girls began their work. Donna guided her around the house from dawn until dusk for several days, pausing only for meals. By the end of the third day, Kate was exhausted. However, she had successfully mapped out the entire house in her mind, including the layout of all the rooms and every object within. Donna had taught Kate to navigate her surroundings by counting her steps, which helped her avoid bumping into walls. She showed her how to use the shower and toilet, brush her teeth, wash her hair, and use the hairdryer. 
Over the course of three days, Kate learned to navigate the kitchen. Donna showed her how to use the microwave, heat her food, fill the kettle, and wash dishes. Kate became self-sufficient in feeding herself and cleaning up. In two weeks, Donna taught her skills that Damien hadn't. Instead of doing chores for Kate, Donna empowered her to manage on her own. She helped Kate realize her self-reliance and the possibility of entertaining herself at home. Kate learned to use the vacuum cleaner, clean the floors and dust. This kept her occupied and made her feel alive and productive. Donna saved the most challenging task for the final week. When she shared her plan with her cousin, it was the first time Kate felt bold enough to disagree. No, I don't want to. It's out of the question. Do you want me to die of fright on the spot? No, no, I can't do that, she exclaimed, feeling powerless. But Kate, you understand that you can't continue like this forever, right? You have to get used to the idea that I won't always be around. You need to conquer your fear. You've seen how it's done in movies, haven't you? Donna calmly continued, trying to convince her. That's in the movies. Everything seems so easy there. But this is real life. It's entirely different. I can't, Donna. I really can't. How can you even know if you haven't even tried? Give it a shot. Practice for a week, and then tell me if you can't. I'm not asking for something impossible, just for you to try. What if you can do it? What if you end up liking it? Donna tried persuading her all evening, but Kate was adamant. Just when Donna was about to give in and admit defeat, Kate suddenly agreed. Okay, fine, I'll try. But promise me, if after a week I tell you I don't want to any more, you won't force me, okay? Okay. Yes, I promise. Donna was happy, but she was sure it wouldn't happen. And the next morning, the two women went outside, and Donna began to teach her cousin how to walk outside on her own. Their yard had a fence, so Donna was not afraid that Kate would go somewhere far away and get lost. For several days, they spent mornings through evenings walking together, with Kate learning to determine possible routes by counting steps from Donna's chosen paths. She also learned to use the curbs for guidance. It was challenging, yet thrilling. Donna taught Kate the locations of several benches. By the end of the week, Kate could find them on her own. A triumphant achievement. Saturday night, after exchanging good night wishes, they had dispersed to their bedrooms, when Kate looked back and asked, Sorry to bother you, I just wanted to tell you. Donna, I don't know how to express my gratitude. You've done so much for me that I'll never be able to thank you enough. You're... you're my saviour. I'm so grateful for your help. You have brought me back to life in these three weeks. I can do so many things now. They may seem like simple things, but they're so important to me. I mean, I want to keep going outside. I love walking, breathing the fresh air. Forgive me for ever doubting you. Donna was moved to tears. Her cousin's words were so heartfelt that it was impossible to remain untouched. She hugged Kate and whispered in her ear, We'll continue. Do more. I'll teach you everything, and then I'll let you go free swimming. Kate decided not to ask what those words meant. She chose to leave that for later. Three months passed. Kate went out alone every day, but not too far. A couple of times per week, she would go out in the evenings with Donna, who didn't even hold Kate's hand, just walked beside her, occasionally guiding her in the right direction. One day, a significant mishap occurred. Kate was descending the stairs for a walk outside. As she approached the last step, her foot hit a pebble that instantly skittered away. She lost her balance and fell onto her back. The moment her head forcibly struck the pavement, she thought she saw a blue flash before her eyes, like the sky. Then it vanished, and Kate lost consciousness. She regained consciousness in the hospital, immediately recognising the familiar scent of disinfectants. Someone was holding her hand. 
Kate tried to turn her head, but her neck wouldn't move. She panicked at the thought of being paralysed from the fall. Was she not only blind, but now also immobile? She refused to accept this possibility. This felt like a nightmare. What's wrong with her? Her breathing is odd, Kate heard Donna's voice. I think she's panicking. We'll give her a sedative now, a male's voice she didn't recognise said. No, no, I don't need a sedative, please, no injection. First, tell me how serious this is. I'll never walk again, will I? Just don't lie to me. What are you thinking, Kate? Have you lost your mind? Doctor, is she all right? Donna sounded alarmed. Oh, yes, she's fine. She just thinks she's paralysed. Isn't that right, Kate? I'm telling you, don't worry. Everything is fine. The doctor's voice was extraordinary, as if it was wrapped in a mist of warm dewdrops. They seemed to leave traces on her skin, giving her goosebumps. Kate, my name is Ben Conaty. I'm your doctor. You're not paralysed. You had a hard bump and strained your neck. We decided to secure your neck as a precaution. You're wearing a special brace that restricts your head movement. You can move your arms and legs if you don't believe me. Indeed, Kate found she could move all her limbs. She sighed in relief. That was all she needed. Oh my gosh, thank you. I thought I was done for. When I noticed that blue flash in my eyes as I fell, I thought I'd never get up again. It was terrifying, I tell you. Then Dr. Conaty asked Donna in a worried tone, You said she was completely blind, isn't that right? Kate answered in place of Donna, Yes, I am completely blind. A serious accident has left me unable to see. Dr. Conaty took her hand, and Kate felt a rush of goosebumps from his touch. Kate, what did the doctors say? You've visited doctors, haven't you? Can you share what anyone who examined you said? All I remember is one professor and some hospital doctors. They all said the same thing. I'll never see again. No one has examined me. Dr. Conaty responded passionately. If you don't mind, I'd like to run some tests. It's not just about your eyesight. I'm also concerned about your neck, your spine. I want to add something. If your blindness were permanent, you wouldn't have seen the blue flash you mentioned. Your vision loss might not be related to the head injury, but could be due to an entirely different cause. I want to see for myself, if you'll allow me. Kate agreed. Within a month, Dr. Conaty performed numerous examinations, not just on her eyesight, but also her skeletal and muscular system. Although she had been discharged, Donna brought her in for ongoing checkups and consultations. She was examined by several neurologists, a psychiatrist, and neurosurgeon. After all these examinations, Dr. Conaty gave his verdict. Kate, I can confidently assert that there's an extremely high probability your vision can be restored. Our examination revealed that a pinched nerve is causing your vision problems. One surgery could very likely restore your sight. Upon hearing this, Kate cried. Dr. Conaty took her hand, and again goosebumps ran along her skin. Why did his touch have such an effect on her? Kate quickly calmed down, because the doctor's voice enveloped her from all sides, making her feel safe. Dr. Conaty spent a long time persuading her to consider the surgery, emphasising that she had nothing to lose. Over the course of a month, they conducted thorough examinations and analyses of her case. Dr. Conaty conversed extensively with Kate, compiling a comprehensive medical history. Caught up in the process, Dr. Conaty found himself developing feelings for Kate. She was more than just a patient to him. This lively, vibrant and emotional woman stirred within him feelings he thought were long buried. But above all, he was determined to help her regain her sight and resume a normal life. Eventually, Kate agreed to the operation, and the operation was scheduled in three days. They sat in his office discussing the final preparations. Kate was to be admitted to the hospital the following day. When Dr. Conaty 
got up to walk her to the door, Kate suddenly put her hand on his shoulder and said, "Can I do something? I've always been curious about this. When I've seen it in movies, I want to understand what blind people experience when they do this. May I?" Doctor Conaty didn't understand what she was referring to, but he agreed without hesitation. Kate reached out and traced her fingers across his face. She delicately explored his forehead, eyebrows, eyes, cheeks, lips, and chin. Then she ran her hand through his hair and smiled. Usually, after something like this, people say, "You're handsome," or "I know what you look like," but alas, I didn't discover anything. I just know you have very smooth skin and no beard. Thank you. And excuse me, Doctor Conaty smiled and said quietly, "I'm sure you can still get a good look at me. I hope you don't say that I'm ugly, and you don't like me at all. No, I won't say that. No, I won't say that. If I regain my sight, I'll thank you for giving me a second chance at life. You will be there during the operation, won't you? Of course, I'll be there." Three days later, Kate was wheeled into the operating room. She was very nervous and tried to stay calm, but it was difficult. She hardly held back her tears. Before entering the operating room, Doctor Conaty took her hand, leaned in, and quietly said, "I wanted to say this after the operation, but I can't hold back. I usually don't have any relationship with my patients, but soon." You won't be my patient. Once this is all over, would you have dinner with me? Kate giggled nervously. <laughs> I can't promise. I need to look at you first. What if you're not so handsome as Doctor House? Doctor Conaty laughed and let go of her hand. Inside the operating room, Kate wished she had said something different. She was too scared to admit that she would be happy to have dinner with him, even. If she never regained her sight, Kate awoke with a severe headache and groaned. Immediately, a nurse approached her. "What's wrong? Are you in pain?" she asked. "My head hurts," Kate murmured. The nurse promptly administered an injection, and within fifteen minutes, the headache had subsided. Kate, weak and anxious from the anaesthesia, couldn't move. She was left wondering about her fate. As a bandage covered her eyes, soon to be removed, the anticipation was terrifying. Two hours later, the medical staff gathered around her. The nurse gently lifted the bandage from Kate's eyes. "You can open your eyes now, but do it slowly," urged Doctor Conaty. Kate opened her eyes. Miraculously, she could see again. The dimmed light was slightly uncomfortable, but she was able to see it. Overwhelmed with emotion, she started to look around, blinking and squinting constantly. "My goodness, I can see," she murmured. A doctor examined her briefly and declared that she was out of danger and would be fine. He said something else, but she didn't catch it. A single thought pulsed in her mind: she could see again. She was no longer blind. Fearfully, Kate closed her eyes. Then she felt someone take her hand. Recognizing the touch was Doctor Conaty's from the goosebumps on her skin, she slowly opened her eyes. She looked at the man who had saved her, and the pounding of her heart quickened. She recognized him from her dreams. He was the same man who had reached out to her in her dreams when she opened the door. In the dark room, hello, Doctor Conaty greeted, smiling at her. Kate tightened her grip on his hand. Hi, she responded, smiling back. So, how are you feeling? A tear trickled down her cheek. Great, it couldn't be better. I feel like I've been reborn. So, when's dinner? She asked. Doctor Conaty feigned a frown. We have plenty of time for that. You're still my patient. Let's not discuss it now. 
A year had passed since the operation. Kate and Ben Connerty had been living together for a long time, and true love blossomed between them. Kate was in good health, her eyesight fully restored. However, she remained officially married to Damien, which clouded her happiness. Despite his lack of contact over the past year, she finally decided to visit him to resolve their situation. Returning to her hometown after more than a year, Kate felt neither trepidation nor regret. She had made the right choice to leave, having found true happiness and love. On her way to the high-rise building, where she once lived with Damien, she felt a twinge of anxiety. How would he react to her recovery? Would he be pleased or saddened? Regardless, her feelings were unaffected. After paying the cab driver, she stood for a few moments before slowly heading towards the entrance. As she ascended the steps, her skin prickled with goosebumps. She paused, turned, and gazed at the cars parked in front of the driveway. Her gaze settled on a yellow Jaguar. A throbbing sensation filled her head as she recognized the car. She had seen it before, but where? She felt strange, like she was missing something important, like... She was missing some detail. Suddenly, it hit her. That was the car that had struck her on the deserted street. Unbelievable. Oh, my God. Is it really that car? Kate turned pale, her palms damp with sweat. She had hoped to escape her past, but instead, it seemed to be haunting her. Kate retreated then turned abruptly and climbed the stairs, trying to clear her mind. The thought of that woman being nearby was too much. She needed to reach her and Damien's home immediately, settle everything, and then escape to Ben. When Damien opened the door, he was taken aback. He hadn't expected to see his wife on the doorstep. Kate looked at him and said, "'Well, hello, my dear hubby. Surprised?' "'Kate? How?' Your sight has returned? How is that possible? Damien was shocked. Kate simply grinned. Anything is possible. You just didn't believe it. Honestly, I didn't either until I met people who made me believe. They helped me, and voila! Now you are going to let me into our apartment, or should I bring a lawyer? A lawyer? Why would you need a lawyer? Pushing past him, Kate entered the apartment. Immediately, she noticed signs of another woman's presence. Shoes, cosmetics in the hallway, a purse, perfume. The new woman had already made herself at home. Damien hadn't wasted any time. Kate wondered if this was the same woman he had cheated on her with, or a new one. "'I see you're doing well. Sorry to disrupt your idyllic life, but I came to tell you I'm filing for divorce.' Damien turned pale his gaze drifting towards the bedroom. Fear flickered in his eyes. It dawned on Kate that his mistress was here too. Well, she thought, it was time to meet her. Honey, who's there? Is it the grocery delivery? A voice echoed from the bedroom. Kate frowned. His mistress had a grating voice, similar to a creaking floorboard. She raised an eyebrow and whispered to Damien, Why haven't you introduced us? Does she know about me, or did you tell her I was dead? Have you lied to her, that we've been divorced for ages? A woman in a negligee then appeared in the hallway. She was a petite, red-haired woman. Kate began to study the woman. She felt like she had seen her before, but couldn't recall where they had crossed paths. She scrutinized the woman's face, who, in response, crossed her arms and glared back defiantly. Who the hell are you? Clearly not a courier, she spat in her grating voice. And you're clearly not the housekeeper. I'm Damien's wife, and you're his mistress. The woman turned to Damien. Darling, you told me she was blind. Have you been lying to me? Wendy, I haven't deceived you. She was indeed blind. I can't comprehend what's happening, I swear. Wendy, I had nothing to do with it. Kate looked at them both and smirked. Damien was grovelling before his Wendy. They were a perfect match. 
I don't know why you're here, but you don't belong here. You're no longer Damien's wife, right? You left him. I'm in charge now. The woman sneered at her. But Kate wasn't phased. No, I'm still the owner here, even if it's only half. I'm here to fix it. Damien, I'm filing for divorce, and we're splitting this place in half. I think that's all I needed to say. Kate turned and walked towards the door. Her gaze fell on a table near the hallway. On it was a bright yellow key fob with a jaguar badge. Goosebumps ran down her spine. She suddenly realised something. She turned to the woman and asked, Is that your car in the driveway, the yellow jaguar? Wendy grinned and replied, Yes, it is. Why do you ask? Are you envious? You won't find another like it. It's a custom paint job. Then it hit Kate. She knew this woman. She was the one who had hit her with her car and fled the scene. She was the one who caused her loss of sight. So, you're the one who hit me. You're the person who left me unconscious on the road. Wendy turned pale and covered her mouth with her hand. Damien, completely confused, shifted his gaze from one woman to the other. Wendy, what is she talking about? What does all this mean? Were you the one who hit her? I don't understand what you mean, he asked. I never ran anyone over. None of this is true, Wendy responded to Kate. No, it was you. I saw you then and your hair and the sticker on the window. I remember everything. I remember you now with your red hair. I'll never forget it. You're so disgusting. You'll answer for everything in court. I'll make sure you pay for all my suffering, Kate exclaimed. Wendy sobbed. Her courage suddenly left her and she began to look very strange. Her eyes bulged out in fear and her face was as flaming as her hair. She didn't know what to say. You'll pay for everything you've done, both of you, Kate said and walked out of the apartment. Kate divorced Damien. She decided not to sue Wendy. Damien pleaded with her not to, promising to give up his rightful half of the apartment in return. Kate realised that Damien was willing to do anything for his mistress. He didn't care that Wendy was the cause of their breakup. Kate, content with her present life, had no intention of revisiting the painful past. She had sole ownership of the apartment after her divorce, and had no idea about the whereabouts of her ex-husband or the woman who caused her blindness. She was determined to erase them from her memory forever. After pricing the apartment reasonably for a quick sale, she promptly sold it. With the money from the sale, she immediately returned to Ben. As she rode the train, she couldn't help but smile. She planned to give the remaining money from the sale of her parents' apartment to Donna as a token of gratitude. Donna had been instrumental in helping Kate start anew, even though Kate anticipated Donna would refuse the money, she was resolved to find a way. The proceeds from the sale of the apartment, with Damien, would remain in her bank account for now. Kate was excited about her upcoming marriage to Ben, and looked forward to the birth of their child, who she was already carrying. As she gently stroked her belly, her smile broadened. All her dreams were coming true, one after another. And this was just the beginning.